640410 scriptural signs of the time Birmingham Alabama USA we thank you for this let us bow our heads a moment for prayer most gracious Heavenly Father we approach a great throne a majesty tonight in the name of Jesus Christ knowing this that we have the assurance that you'll hear us we have no other name that we can be assured that you'll hear us in but he said if you'll ask in my name so we pray that you'll receive us into the kingdom tonight and we will live here saying like those who came from Emmaus do not our hearts burn within us as he spoke to us along the way father we think of them on that fine first beautiful resurrection morning Jesus alive and among the people and yet they some that loved him didn't recognize it so is it tonight lord after 1900 years you're still alive and among us and many people doesn't realize it though those men should have understood it they know the scripture said he'd raise up but father i guess is just human beings forgive us lord and we pray now that your grace will be sufficient for us tonight and grant your blessings upon all who are waiting and those under anticipation for their physical healing grant lord it will be tonight that they can reach up by faith and believe you we ask it in jesus christ's name amen you may be seated reverend jack moore is he in the building reverend jack moore you are wanted at the book stand right away brother jack moore we are happy to be here tonight again in the service of the lord and with great anticipations believing that god will meet us upon the ground that we he has promised to meet us on now we do not claim to have any power I don't believe that we have power to heal the sick. We don't have power, but we have authority. See, it's not power. For, see, for instance, it's a policeman standing out in the street. He weighs 110 pounds, and here comes a whole row of traffic at 80 miles an hour, 300 horsepower engines in them, and they're buzzing down the street. 300 horsepower engines. Why? That little fellow doesn't have power to stop one of them. But just let that bird shine and raise up his hand. Listen at the bricks quick. Watch them slide sideways. It isn't his power that stops him. It's his authority. And the church has an authority from Jesus Christ. In my name, the shakas of devils speak with new tongues. If they take up serpents or drink deadly things, it will not hurt them. Harm them if they lay their hands on the sick, they shall recover. And that's his given authority now. What if the same little policeman is afraid to raise his hand and step out in the traffic? He better take off the uniform, present the badge back because he'll never make a policeman. Neither will we ever make a believer as long as you're free to exercise the authority that's been given us by Jesus Christ. We have victory. We don't have to have any. We don't have to fight for victory. We already have victory. He conquered for us. Not us. He conquered for us. We are not the mighty conqueror. He is a mighty conqueror. Now remember tomorrow night, in the Lord willing, these first couple nights, it's just a shame to run into a city like this and just get acquainted, shake hands, leave. And that's not fair to the people. It's not fair to the ministry. It certainly isn't because the ministry is a little on the phenomena side. And you just have a night or two to about two nights to introduce it then stop in for the sick and the people run up in the prayer line not even hardly knowing what they're coming for just blindly jumping into it it should be laid out and showed scripturally word by word that is thus saith the lord and that is true the message of the hour to abraham's loyal or royal seed through jesus christ for your heirs with abraham according to the promise as we be christ we are abraham's children and are heirs with him to the promise of the royal seed, not the seed through Isaac, that was natural, through sex. Jesus was a seed without sex. He was a, he was God himself. We are not saved by Jewish blood, neither we saved by Gentile blood. He was neither Jew nor Gentile. He was God. He was not. Nothing short of God, see, he was. We know he was conceived in the womb of a Virgin Mary. She was just an incubator. She, not like the egg was not hers, neither that wasn't her egg, nor it wasn't no man's germ or male germ, which is a hemoglobin, which is a blood cell, is in the male sex. We know that a hen can lay an egg, but if she hasn't been with the male bird, it'll never hatch. It has to be with the male bird first. The male packs the blood cell, and the life is in the blood. And this was God himself, who... So now the prophet testant believes that the egg belonged to Mary. The egg cannot be produced. 
without a sensation. So what would you make God do then, see? God made both egg and blood cell. He was God, the flesh of God. We seen God handle God with the hands. Without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness, for God was manifested in the flesh, seen of angels, handled here in the world, received up into glory. So we find in this now that he was God made flesh. He tabernacled with us, he changed his great position from being the great eternal one, as we spoke last night, he was an attribute of his own thought. He become down here, there, and become man to redeem man. Why? It's not, it's the most lovely story. I don't see how people could ever stare sinner and say that, how that God became one of us. It's so beautifully illustrated there. How I'd like to preach it to you in Naomi and Ruth and Naomi how he became the kinsman redeemer and had to be a redeemer and had to be king folks and how God in spirit couldn't be kin to us and he became kin to us when God made man in his own image he was a spirit man and there was no man to till the soil then he put him in the earth after in five senses he made him an animal with the spirit of God in him now we are animal life we know that we are mammal mammal warm-blooded animal and then God came down in the form of a man as man took the form of God then God took the form of man to redeem man back redeemed oh my what a beautiful picture how what a wonderful thing we have now tonight just a short service I held you long last night after nine o'clock I noticed the people begin one getting up working here, going out, why see? That disturbs, it distracts from the meeting. And when it does, it's not your fault. Maybe you had uh, to catch a bus or something and you have to be there. I know what that means. I'll try to hurry. Now, tomorrow night, if God willing, I want to take an evangelistic text and preach to you tomorrow night, the Lord willing. Tonight, I want to read some scripture and just give a few quotations just to background a little bit because not understanding the message and you're all, practically everyone, strangers to me and not knowing nothing about the message and then not knowing what all this is about. We just wish I'd haphazardly at it. I want you to understand it's a promise of God for this day. The days of Wesley would never work today. The days of Luther, what was the manner with the Lutherans? They Wesley found they were living in the glare of Lutheran light and God raised up Wesley. And what's the matter? What was the matter with Wesley? They were living in the glare of Wesley when Pentecost raised up. Now, what's the matter with Pentecost? Living in a Pentecostal glare. A glare is a reflection of a light, like a mirage on the road. If the light has been and reflected its light, that was the same thing that rejected Jesus. They were living in the glare of another light of the light of the law, and they refused or failed to see the Messiah when they see their own prophet told just exactly what he would do, how he would be identified, and there he was just exactly the way he said he would be, and yet they failed to see him because they were living in a glare of another day. I want to dear friends, what would your present state now identify you with some of those characters of the Bible? Now think of it. All them Pharisees and Sadducees and great religious groups and how starched and great they was. Now, just think, what side would you have took if Jesus was on earth? Not even, not a church would let him into it. Nobody, but just a few friends. Now, you know that's prophesied again in the last days. That's right. And did you know also that in that day he was supposed to be uh, an educated, illegitimate person. Did you know that? Did you know he was supposed to be a man out of his mind? One day, he said to the disciples, looked around, there was too many with him. He said, except you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Now, what do you think a doctor or scientist or some smart intellectual person would have thought? That man's a vampire and trying to get us all of us to be a vampire drink human blood eat he never explained it he didn't have to explain it the real genuine predestinated seed will catch it showed it in the little woman we talked about last night yet in her condition she just found out what it was quickly and he said then he and the 70 men 
that he called for disciples. He said, what will you say when you see the Son of Man ascending up from where he came from? Ascending up, we see the cradle he was rocked in, and we know his mother, we know the manger he was born in, we come from the city, he fishes with us, and so forth. Who is this guy? Why we? Well, that was too hard for them to believe. And they went away. Then he said to the twelve, I choose twelve of you, and one of you is a devil. Then he said to them, Do you want to go also? Now, he never explained it. He never told them what his flesh was and what his blood was. He never told them how he came down and how he was going back up. But watch, all the time the disciples couldn't explain it either. But they believed it. They couldn't explain it. They were ordained to that life. They couldn't explain it. Peter said, Lord, to whom would we go? They know the message of the hour. They know what it is supposed to be. They said, we know that thou and thou alone has a word of life. There is no place else we can go. Where could I go to what place today unless I went to Christ the Bible? He is an inexhaustible fountain of God. The more you draw from it, the fresher and better it gets. Now, if you will, I want to read a little text tonight or read some uh, scripture. And then we'll go right straight to the message and try to be out of here by nine or a little after, if all possible. And that's just going to be about 30 or 35 minutes. Shall we stand while we return to St. Matthew 12, the 12th chapter of St. Matthew, beginning with the 38th of us, while we reverently bow our hearts? Then certain of the scribes and of the Pharisees answered, saying, Master, we would see a sign from thee. But he answered and said unto them, An evil and an adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, and no sign shall be given to it but the sign of the prophet Jonas. For as Jonas was three days and three nights in the world's building, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Men of Nineveh shall rise in the judgment with this generation, shall condemn it because they repented of the preaching of Jonas. And behold, a greater than Jonas is here. The queen of the south shall rise up in the judgment with this generation and shall condemn it, for she came from the utmost parts of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. And behold, a greater than Solomon is here. Behold, a greater than Solomon is here. Let us pray, Lord. Behold means look up to. Pay attention. Let us remember tonight these words that a greater than all is here. The Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, we ask this blessing that shall make these words and anoint them to the hearts of the people, that they might have faith. Then show himself alive as he promised to be. Lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the world, or the consummation. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. We will speak just a little for a few moments on a scriptural signs of the time. Now Jesus here was rebuking the generation because they had not believed his scriptural sign. What these Pharisees, they come to him and said, Master, we would seek a sign from thee. Watch the blindness of them. The sign had already been done and they didn't recognize it. Do you believe? Do you know? I believe that one day the rapture will take place and people will know nothing about it. Jesus said in Saint Matthew the eleventh chapter, when John had come to, or his disciples had come to see him, and they returned back. And he said, What went ye out to see? A reed shaken with the wind, or a man in fine raiment, or did you go out to see a prophet? He said, I see a prophet indeed. Now, if you can receive it, why? This is he who was spoken of by the prophet, saying, I send my messenger before my face. One day the disciples asked him, said, when he was talking about being the Son of Man, he said, Why is it then that the scribes say that Elias must first come? Now look in Malachi, the third chapter, said that I'll send my messenger before my face. Jesus referred to the scripture, not Malachi 4. Now, that's another time. See, Malachi 3 was one time. I send my messenger before my face. Malachi 4, when he comes, then the earth is going to be burnt and the righteous walk out upon the ashes in the millennium and we never did that after the coming of john but it will be after the coming of the last day messenger that will return the hearts of the people back to the original gospel the faith of the early fathers the kind they had at in the new church at jerusalem and they will be restored in the last days to the it will be in a minority group and it will be just the same kind of a character as Elijah and John 
both wilderness lovers, women haters, and so on, and denominational blasters, and will be just the same type of a person, but have the truth. I've indicated, identified truth. It's promised. Now, we know that Jesus turned and said to him, Elias has already come, and you didn't know it. Now, will it be very sad one of these days if we find the church over in the tribulation period? Now, I'm not here to preach doctrine. I don't do that. I respect my brothers, but if you'll forgive me, let me just inject this just a moment. I, for myself personally, certainly, I believe the church goes through the tribulation period, but not the bride. Uh -huh. The bride goes home, see? God brings a bride out of a church like he brought a nation out of a nation in Egypt, see? The bride, that's a remnant of the woman's seed, the elected. And that's his business where he puts his pattern. But the remnant is what's cut off from the pattern. The woman's seed was into outer darkness, right? But not the elected church. It's already judged and purified because it's in Christ. You don't have to go through anything else. The others has to go through judgment because they wasn't in. None of these days, that little minority, as it was in the days of Noah, where in eight souls were saved by water, so shall it be in the coming of the Son of Man, in the days of Lot, where in three souls were saved from fire, so shall it be at the coming of the Son of Man. They were looking for a great big universe or something, when it's not even in the scripture, see, one of these days you'll say, well, I thought the Bible would say that the church will escape all of this. The bride escapes this. And just think after Noah, as it was in the days of Noah, Noah went in the ark and closed, the door was closed. He went in on the May the 17th. The door was closed and never rained for seven days after he was in the ark. And he didn't know it. God closed the door. And one day the door of mercy will be closed and people will go right on thinking they're getting saved and preaching and so forth. And mercy has then been spurned this last time and know it not until it's missing. Remember, there's hundreds of people missing every day that we cannot find or give an account for them all over. There will be one in the field, I'll take one. One in the, two in the bed, I'll take one. Universal. So it won't take very many to make that ra escape. Ruptured bride. Remember the signs. Israel was always relied upon their signs instead of intellectual speeches. They were supposed to. God sent them prophets. The prophets give signs. And signs always, when there's a sign, a scriptural sign, there has got to be a scriptural voice follow that scriptural sign. And it must be all scriptural promised. So see, you get into a trend, like Luther, on justification, that's what he knowed, that's all, they satisfied and went right down into the doctrine. <coughs> Here come Wesley, with sanctification, went right on a passage, then he organized along camp Pentecost with the restoration of the gifts, and they organized. And God moves right on, right straight on all the time, see, for each day, each church age. You have a standing picture there tonight that's going in that book of three years. How the Lord has let me draw it out on a blackboard and show just how the church ages would fail and when and how they would go up and down. And as soon as it was finished, that great inch of the Lord, that light, before practically as many people sitting here come right on the side of the wall standing there and people fainting and draw it right out with itself on the wall three years later the moon darkened and went right out just exactly in the day just before the pope the first pope went to rome and when the church and the economical council is ready oh brother sister don't let me get started on that. We are right here at the end. Every sign, everything laying just right. God gives signs, scriptural signs, scriptural signs of a voice. Remember, when Moses, what a sign, what a sign given for is to attract attention. A sign is to attract attention. Then if the sign doesn't have any voice, then the sign is not right. And if the sign gives the same old ecclesiastical voice, 
that sign isn't from God. If that voice has then got a change, and that change must be a scriptural sign, must be a scriptural voice, say for instance, his denominational voice followed a certain sign. God never sent that. We have had denomination all these years is got to be something different. It's got to be thus saith the Lord in the scripture. God's got to promise it by the word, and then a sign is to attract the people's attention to it, and then the voice follows a sign, and that's the doctrine goes with it. Jesus was well thought of a man. He was a young rabbi, the prophet of Galilee. He, when he was healing the sick and so forth, he was a great man. But one day he sat down and he began to talk and tell them, I and the Father are one. That was a voice that followed it. Oh no, they didn't want that. They was ready for the sign. But the voice they didn't want. When you see the Son of Man ascending up from where he come from, they couldn't see that at all, see? But when the voice began to follow the sign, they didn't want nothing to do with it. Always a sign and a voice. The reason Moses took off his shoes, the sign attracted his attention. He looked over there and he saw that that tree on fire. Now he was a chemist. He was a great scientist. He was taught in all the wisdom of the Egyptians. And they done things that we can't do today in science. Build a pyramid, sphinxes, have embalming fluid that we don't have, coloring that we don't have. It was a greater civilization than and more educated than we are today. And Moses was a master over them. And when he saw that tree burning and not burning down, no doubt but what he said, my, in his heart, he might have said, I'll go over and pick a few of those leaves and take them down to the laboratory and see what chemical they sprayed with. If he'd have done that, the voice would never have talked to him. You can't figure God out. You've got to sit down by the side of him and talk it over. Take off your shoes, as it were. Lay down your education. Look straight into his word and say, I don't care what anyone else says. You has promised it here for this day. And it's a truth. Moses took off his shoes. What the voice that come from it. If it hadn't been a scriptural voice, Moses wouldn't have believed it. The sign attracted the attention and the sign was to attract the attention of the people. Attention of the prophet. A prophet himself is a sign. When God sends a prophet, look out, judgment follows it. It always has, it always will. There is no way around it. And it goes right over the top of the people. And they never know it until it's too far. No wonder Jesus said, you build the tombs of the prophets and whitened, but, and you're the one that was put them in there. And as your fathers did, so will you. And they did it. Now, we see coming on the scene now, we see Moses rising up here and he's seen that bush. And he drew near it and a voice come from it, said, take off your shoes for the ground on where you're standing is holy. He took off his shoes and held down and he said, I'm the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. There come a scriptural voice and I remember my promise and I see the afflictions of my people. I remember my promise and I'm sending you down there to do it. And I'm making you as my voice and I'll give you two signs. And one of them will be in your hand and you'll take and turn a serpent or a pole into a serpent. And the next thing is put his hand in his bosom and divine healing said, if they won't believe the voice of the first sign, then they will believe the voice of the second sign. And if they don't take water out of the river, pour it upon the ground and it will become blood. That their blood is really drenched in it then. Egypt is finished. We have had the first and got the second. I wonder if the next isn't a drenching of the blood. Wonder where we are standing tonight. Voices and signs, God giving them signs. No, just think of how the things that we have seen done. Scripture, voices, interpretation. Now, in this great glare, the people is laying under. Their eyes glared out, I belong to this, I belong to that. And that has no more to do with it than nothing else, not at all. God in every generation has sent his signs. Jesus said before his coming, he would show signs before his coming. People are always 
Remember, to believe scriptural signs, they must be identified scripture signs. God always, as I said last night, the church gets mixed up and gone out. Then he anoints one person, every man different from the other. He anoints one, God is one. So he anoints a person, he never did use a group. He always uses one, always has. He never changes his course, he uses one. And he sends that forth, preaches a message, is rejected flatly. But all that will come, will come from that generation. First watch, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, then seventh. And then the bridegroom come, and we are in the seventh. And you find these denominational churches running. And I was ashamed of these Christian businessmen. The other night, putting it in that book, that businessman's book, Holy Father so and so, don't you the cost people know that we are not supposed to call any man father on this earth that shows that some kind of a glare has blinded your eyes? Yes, and you don't realize them people the Bible said when this remnant, this sleeping virgin, come up to buy oil that they didn't get it. They might have danced in the spirit, spoken tongues. But I've seen devils do that. That ain't got nothing to do with it. I'm talking about the Holy Ghost, the Bible Holy Ghost. I've seen them carry on in the heathen fields. I've seen seven times around the world in all kinds of heathens and around hundreds of thousands, as many as 150,000 people and yeah, or 50,000 people gather at one time and find out that how that witch doctors and everything else challenging you to it you better know what you're talking about you better not just have intellectual talk you better be able by god to support what you're talking about or don't get on that field there they'll make you embarrassed but remember our god is still the god of elijah he is still the god that he ever was he's still the same god he moves in the same cycle he does the same thing he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. I see them stand dumbfolded, paralyzed, and taken off the field. God still remains God. Notice. Now, Jesus told us these things will take place in the last days. And we find them just exactly the signs of his coming, everything. We will we all will agree that we are at the end of the world. But when he begins to come down to the church and the things he's going to do for the church, the body, the bride in the last days, then we turn our nose up and walk away. See, it's just, it's got to be that way. The world turns up their nose at that. They try to ignore it. Look at these here television programs where too many Pentecostal people stay home on Wednesday night to watch We Love Susie, some moral act of some married woman married four or five times or some man and love that better than you do your own church, your Christ. No wonder we can't have revival. No wonder we've got such a thing when the love of the world is greater than the love of God that's in your heart. Oh, we can walk up and make a decision, put a name on a book and go out and live with the world. And that's what the world is wanting. That's what the church is wanting. It's wanting to maintain its confession and believe that it is a Christian and live any way it wants to. Don't worry. You're going to get to do it in the economical council. They let you do anything you want to. But remember, the bride will be called out, separated and different, filled, Holy Ghost born, washed in the blood of the Lamb. She'll abstain from everything that's filthy around her husband. She's a chaste virgin pure by the word the word and her are the same as a man and his wife becomes one in union so that the real genuine church of god when he becomes in christ the bible is punctuated with an amen every promise don't make any difference what the generation says the soul that's in the believer punctuate it because it's the word in him speaking out the word is sharper than a two-edged sword a design of the thoughts and intents of the heart the Bible said so. That's how it's vindicated and known. Notice, my brother, notice, it's too bad that we don't see these things. Jesus spoke of them. He was the scriptural sign, and they recognized him not. He was exactly the scriptural sign. He told them he was. He said, such scriptures, in them you think you have eternal life, and they are they, they are one that testify of me. If I do not the works of my father, believe it not. Everybody has got his own private interpretation. 
Every denomination has the seminaries, hot water, bunch of incubator preachers. I always felt sorry for incubator chicken. It has no mummy, no matter how much it chopped, wasn't mothered. That's the way these machines turn out clergymen. Sometimes knows no more about God than a hot and taunt does about Egyptian knight or rabbit know how to put on snowshoes. What we need is an experienced preacher that's been on the backside of the desert till he stayed in that place under God until the pillar of fire come down before him like he did Moses, and nobody can take that from him. He was there when it happened. Now that is true. Back to God and back to his Bible. Jesus said, if you'd have known me, you would have known my day. Everybody has their own interpretation. The Methodists has theirs, the Baptists, Presbyterian, Pentecostals, all the rest of them has their interpretation. But the Bible says that the word of God is of no private interpretation. What is the interpretation of it then? He does his own interpreting. He said, let there be light, and there was light. They don't need no interpretation. He said, a virgin shall conceive, and she did. They don't need any interpretation. He said, in the last days, he would pour out his spirit upon all flesh, and he did. They don't need a, no interpretation. It's already done. Right in the face of critics that said it couldn't be done, God did it anyhow, because he's interpreting his word. He said it, as it was in the days of Sodom, so shall it be, in the end time, when the Son of Man is being revealed, and he did it, there is no need of any interpretation. It interprets itself. All these promises that he made, he said, He that believeth on me, the work that I do, the things that I do, shall he also, don't need any interpretation. He just does it. That's all. If I am the vine, and ye the branches, the same life is in the vine, is in the branches, the same branch that come forth on the day of Pentecost. I stood the other day and seen a mysterious sight, a good friend of mine and a friend of Jack Moore, John Sherritt, the Lord blessed him. In the first part of the ministry, he had no children. He worked for 25 cents an hour, busting concrete on the street. He came to the meeting, the Lord blessed him, he got five children, and now he owns half of Phoenix, gives about two or three million each year to the Lord. I was standing on his farm not long ago, one of them where he had 1,500 Mexicans working steady and a whole county of nothing but cotton potatoes. County after county, he owns them himself and uh, 15 years ago was getting a quarter an hour for breaking concrete. He trusted God. I was looking at one of his trees and it had so many different kind of fruit on it he has great citrus orchards, and I said, Brother Sharit, what about that tree there? He said, Brother Branham, that's got all kind of fruit on it. I said, well, it's got lemons. It's got, I see, tangerines, tangelo, I see lemons, grapefruit, and oranges. I said, what kind of a tree is that? He said, an orange tree. I said, orange, with all of them on it? He said, yes, that's grafted. It's pushed in there. And I said, oh, I see. That's what you call grafting. He said, yes, Brother Branham. He explained how they done it. Certain times of the year, how they grafted this limb. I said, now, next year, there won't be any tangerines. There won't be any tangelos. There won't be any fruit at all, but nothing but oranges. He said, oh, no, no, no. He said, the grapefruit will bring the vine or the grapefruit will bring forth a grapefruit vine. A grapefruit, the tangerine, will bring a tangerine. The lemon will bring a lemon. Well, I said, what kind of a tree is that? He said, an orange tree. He said, but if that orange tree ever puts forth another branch, I said, what will it bring? He said, an orange. I said, I see it. Oh, yes. Why? They are all citrus fruit. We all claim to be in Christ. But we come in there, not with a denominational creed, we live by it, that's right. But if that tree ever brings forth another branch, it will be another book of Acts wrote behind it. It will be like the first branch was that come forth. It will be Holy Ghost filled, Holy Ghost inspired, Holy Ghost there will be no creed to it, it will be a word. Many of you take my tips, got the message on the bread tree. The fruit is right in the top for the evening lights to ripen now. And the evening light is ripening the fruit at this time. Now we find they ought to have known him, but they knew him not. So is it in our time. 
they know him not. Jesus here was referring quickly now, so we get to the message. Jesus was referring back, and he had been doing signs showing them that he was a Messiah, exactly what Messiah was supposed to do, doing the Messianic sign. Oh, many of them who took last night believed it. We find out the woman at the well, she wasn't educated, she was ill-famed, but as soon as she seen that sign, she said, Sir, I perceive your prophet, and I know that when the Messiah cometh, he'll do this. He said, I am he that speaks to you. And when she went into the city of Sychar and told them all the things that he had done, said, Come and see a man who's told me what I've done. Isn't this a very Messiah? And the Bible said he didn't do it anymore. But they believed he on him because of the testimony of a woman of her ill fame. Now, talk about rising the day of Jonas and condemning the generation. Notice, we find out then Nathaniel, Peter, and others who believed. We see the blind Bartimaeus. We see little Zacchaeus in a tree hid. Jesus, he said, he'll never see me appear. And Jesus stood right under the tree and looked up and said, Zacchaeus, come on down. He was a word, and the word designs the thoughts that's in the heart. And the Pharisees and the scholars of that day condemned it because it didn't have the polish of a sign of an ecclesiasm in it. He didn't have the educational standpoint that he should have. He didn't have the tinsel and the stuff that the ecclesiastical should have. A great big hold on. A turned around collar and something, another, with some kind of a word that could speak to be over the top of the common people's head. And the Bible said the common people heard him gladly. He spoke the common language. He lived a common man's life. Then we find out that in doing this, we find what took place. Now, they could not believe it. And they said, this man is Belzebub. He has a false spirit. In other words, he's got a mental telepathy. Or either he's got, he's a fortune teller of some sort. And anybody knows that that's of the devil. And it's impersonation. And so we find out then that they condemned him. Then he was standing here, said, Master, show us a sign. What did he turn to them? He said, A wicked and an adulterous generation seeks after signs. Now watch, a wicked and an adulterous generation, he was prophesying, he said, and they will receive it. The wicked and adulterous generation, and if that ain't the generation we're living in, I don't know why. Remember, all prophecy has a compound meaning. Get in Matthew there, the third chapter, where it said, Out of Egypt, I've called my son. Run the reference back till you find out he was talking about Jacob, his son, but also his greater son, Jesus. He called out of Egypt. Now we find that in there, a wicked and adulterous generation seeks after a sign, and they'll get it. For the wicked and adulterous generation will see the sign of the resurrection. As Jonas was in the whale's belly for three days and nights, so must the Son of Man be in the heart of the earth, then he'll raise up. It's been 2,000 years, and we've got another wicked and adulterous generation, and they're receiving a sign of the resurrected Jesus Christ alive among us. After 1,900 years, he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Jonas, we know him. We know he was a prophet. Many of them refer to him as a, some kind of a runabout. He wasn't. The footsteps of the righteous is order of the Lord. I was reading a book not long ago. He did go to Tashish or he started to eat instead of Nineveh. But that was all in God's plan. The footsteps of the righteous because sometime evil befalls you or something. It was so with Job. He wasn't. Job was the best man in the land in his days. Best man God could find. And yet look what happened to him. He wasn't chastising him. He was trying him. He was proving to Satan he had somebody that would believe him in the face of difficult. So Jonah was the same thing. And we find him on his road down to Nineveh. And he took a ship to Tarshish. And then he and the sea got up. And he was asleep. He told them, tie my hands and feet and throw me out. For I'm the cause of it. And when they throwed him out, a big whale was swimming around through the waters, prowling, and swallowed this prophet. I remember not long ago in 
Louisville, Kentucky, where I used to live across the river in Indiana, they had a wheel over there on a float car. Some little Ricky that had more intelligence, they know how to control, he said now. You have heard the old fable of the wheel swallowing Jonah. He got a baseball, took it back to the esophagus of a whale, and he said, look here, I said, it's a baseball, won't go, even go through it. He said, the old fable of Jonah being swallowed by the whale. He said, just a fable, that was too much for me to stand. I said, just a minute, sir, he explained it. Tell how impossible for a man to get into that throat. I said, you fail to read the scripture, sir, and that is not a fable, it's a truth. He looked at me and said, who are you? I said, I'm Reverend Branham from just across the river. He said, oh, I see a preacher that believes that. I said, with all my heart, with all my heart. And he said, well, you know, he said, looky here, sir, not disputing, and I admire your stand, and so forth. But, said scientifically, said, you couldn't put a man's hand hardly in his throat. I said, sir, you don't read the scripture right. The Bible said that this was a special prepared fish. That's right. God said he's prepared a fish. He's a special. I believe what God says is the truth. This is a special switched his nose up and down and his glasses on two or three times and went on with his lecture. And everybody laughed. It was special fish. God prepared a fish to swallow Jonah. My, I believe it with all of my heart. Now we find out that on his, he swallowed him. Anything a fish after it eats, it goes right down to the bottom. Feed a little goldfish and watch what happened. They go right down to the bottom of the little container. You've got them in and rest their little swimmers on the bottom. The little belly is full. And so they're down there resting. So when this big fish swallowed Jonah, he must have went down to the bottom to rest out of the waves and out of the storm. He was looking around through the revival to see what he could find. And the revival on the sea, you know, swishing up and down the winds. So he found this preacher and swallowed him and went down to the bottom. Now here Jonah, down there in the belly of this whale with his hands and feet tied, laying in the vomit of the whale. Now I've read, I've often heard people say, I was prayed for last night and my hand is no better. It's still crippled. I still have the stomachache. My eyes, I don't see good yet. Oh my, then haul at Jonah. My, if anybody had a case of symptoms, he ought to have had it. If he looked this way, it was Will's belly. That way was Will's belly. Everywhere he looked was Will's belly. And his hands were tied behind him. He was in the Will's belly in the bottom of the sea probably 14 fathoms deep in the bottom of the sea. Now, talk about symptoms. And then you call him backslid. But you know what he said? They are lying vanities. I won't even look at them. But once more will I look to the Holy Temple Lord. Now Jonah knew that when Solomon dedicated the temple, he prayed and said, Lord, if the people be in trouble anywhere, and look to this holy place, then hear from heaven. And he had that much confidence in the prayer of a man that backslid, that made a prayer. How much more? There is none of us in that condition tonight. There is none of us with that kind of a symptoms. And then we look at our symptoms. Why? Why? If he could have had that much confidence in a prayer of a man that backslid, and we are asked to look at heaven, where Jesus sits at the right hand of the majesty on high, in a temple not made with hands, he is expected in there to intercede upon your confession. How much more should we ignore our symptoms and once more I look to the holy promise, Lord, oh my, when we see God on the scene. Now we find out that Jonah, this, is little, this whale carried him in there for three days and nights, took him all the way back around, backtracked the course, went over, and the people of Nineveh had become like they were in the rest of the world now, their great commercial world, their industry was fishing, and all the men fished, and they worshipped idols, and the whale was their sea god. And one day, about 11 o'clock, while they were all out there fishing, here came their sea god in, and licked out 
his tongue and the prophet walked off the gangplank. No wonder they repented. Uh -huh. See, there was a sign. That was a sign. What was the voice? What was the voice? You see, boys, what I can do? No. Repent. Within 40 days, God will destroy the place. Sign and the voice. The voice that followed the sign, repent. He said, and then people that didn't know right hand from left repented at the preaching of Jonas, and a greater than Jonas is here, see. Then he said, the queen of the south shall rise with the generation and condemn it, because she came from the utmost parts of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon, and a greater than Solomon is here. Now when, in closing, I say this, when God sends a gift to the earth, a sign gift, and the people believe it, that's one of the most glorious ages people ever lived. But when he sends a sign and it's rejected, that generation goes into chaos. It always has. What if the people of America tonight would receive the sign of God in these last days? Why are we talking about going to Fort Knox and moving the government down there and digging down into the ground? Why? Them Russian bombs goes at maybe 100, 200 yards down in the ground and blow it for 150 miles. Why? The concussion would go plumb to the lava. You're not safe nowhere on this earth. There's only one safety that's in the arms of Jesus Christ. He is our retreat. But what if we tonight as Americans, and we all trusted in the gift that God gave us, the Holy Ghost, in the last days, why every nation would fear us, like they did in the days of Solomon? God gave Solomon a gift. And now the whole church, everybody believed it. That was a millennium for the Jews. That was the Old Testament millennium in the days of Solomon, a foreshadow of the millennium to come, the golden age of the Jews. Notice, nobody started a war with them. They feared them because they knew their God was real, because they had him in their presence. And the people was all one heart and one accord. Why? The fame went everywhere, everywhere. And you hear, oh, what a great thing great God Israel has, a living God, and his fame went way down into Sheba. Measure it on the map and see how far it is. There's a little queen down there that got to hungering in her heart for God. Every time she'd hear somebody, one of the caravans would come by, she would say, have you been to Palestine? Yes. Tell me about that great revival they got going on up there. And everybody would say, oh, it's marvelous. Did you see it? Yes. How is it? Oh, that great God that they serve has come down and living in one of his servants, and they made him king. Why? He can discern. He knows the very thoughts that in your heart. And you know, they say that God is in the word, and the word is God, and the word discerns the thoughts that's in the heart. And that man's wisdom exceeds anything you have ever heard of. He can discern and know even the thoughts that you are thinking about. Oh, it's a wonderful revival they got up there. And you know, faith cometh by hearing, hearing the word of God, the promise of God. And this little queen got to hunger in, and she wanted to go to this revival. Now she had a whole lot to confront her. Now the first thing, she was a pagan. She would have to go to her priest to ask if she could live. She was a queen. She was in dignity, in a celebrity. Now, no doubt but what she went up to the high priest and she said, Great Holy Father, I understand that there's a revival up in Israel and they're having a great time up there and their God is living and is doing great signs and wonders that we never seen anything like it or heard anything like it. Every caravan I inquire and they say, It's wonderful. May I be excused from a damnation to go visit? I can imagine it. We are not cooperating in that meeting. So you better stay away from it. See, you know, man die, but not spirits. See, then we find out that, no, you better stay away from it. We are not cooperating in that. Well, now look, Holy Father, I understand. Now look here. If there's anything going on, it will be going on among us. Our church would have it. Oh my, yeah. Here it is here. We would have it right here. I can hear the little queen say, rise up. I like her spunk. She raised up and said, I've seen these idols standing here for years. 
I've heard you standing behind the pulpit and preaching about some God that was, some God that was. My great great grandmother had the same story, and not to be a move of no time. They tell me they've got a living God that's living among them, something that's genuine. I want to see it. Now look, if you go, you know what you're going to be. You're associating yourself with a bunch of people, you know. You know they got all this opening Red Seas and all that kind of a stuff. You better not to go up there. Because if you do, well, I'm going anyhow. We'll take your name right off the book. Well, take it off the book. When a person goes to hungering and thirsting for God, there is no book in the world can hold them. Because they're after a book. Take my name off if you want to. I'm going anyhow. I hear that that's a living God, God's reality. I'm going to find out about it. So you just might as well get my name off of it. Now, she had a lot to confront her. Now remember, she made up her mind. She got all the overalls to read what Jehovah was. Now, there's a smart woman. Don't go on somebody else's presumption. Just go what the Bible says he is. Take what he says he is. Find out what he is, if he lives or not. Not what some scholar has said about it, but what he said himself about himself, what he promised. And she began to read now. She had a real good idea. She said, I'm going to pack a lot of gifts and I'm going to take it. And if it's the truth, I'll support it. If it isn't the truth, I can bring my money back. She could teach Pentecostal people something. Supporting radio programs that laugh at the very thing that you believe in. And yet you support it. Let your will, I'll keep still on that, you know. Enough about that anyhow. That's your preacher's business, notice. But that's a shame. She said, if it isn't real, I'll bring back my gifts. So she packed them upon a camel, remember. Look what confronted her. She had a long distance. You know how it takes. She had to go by a camel. You know how long it takes? It takes 90 days, 3 months on the back of a camel. Not in an air-conditioned Cadillac, no, no. 3 days in the back of a camel. No wonder Jesus said she'll rise in the judgment with this generation, condemn it. There's people in Birmingham who wouldn't walk across the street to see the same thing. Buses, streetcars, airplanes, and everything else in our day. No wonder when they rise up, They'll condemn this generation, yes sir, for a greater than Solomon is here. The Holy Ghost himself, notice, we find out then, there is another thought, look. And now Ishmael's children was in the desert, and there were fleet riders, Mai, and robbers, why? She had all the money on there, what? Her little band of eunuchs, guards that she had, and a few maids, they would just cut, drop them right down, and take the treasure, and go on like nothing. But you know, there's something about when your heart begins to hunger to find a reality of God, there's no danger in the way. You don't see any danger. You don't see any failure. You say, well, will I get well? There is no question in your mind. A genuine faith anchors itself. There is nothing going to move it. It's always right there. She never thought about the danger laid ahead. There is one thing she had, one objective she had, one thing she wanted to achieve, and her motives was right. So she went to reach it, for her heart was hungering and thirsting. Blessed are they that hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. That's right. Watch her now as she starts out across the desert, probably traveling at night, resting in the daytime under some oasis, reading the scriptures. Finally, she arrived at the porch of Solomon. When she did, out in the court, she unloaded her camels and set up her tent. Now, she didn't come like some people, some people today. She isn't a, here is an 1864 version of it. I hear they're doing the, they say the Lord is doing this. I'll go down, and the first word said, again, it's what I believe, right at the door, I'll go, see? See, but not her. She brought the word and sat down. She was going to stay there until she was actually convinced. She wasn't going to check her own ideas. She was going to check the word. So, 
She went in, I imagine, the first day. She sat down, way back in the back, and the trumpet sound, the bells tolled out, and all the singers went to singing. The Ark of the Covenant was there at the place, and Pastor Solomon came out, sat down. She said, Now, I'll see whether God is in the man or not. So she watched, and every case began to move. Oh, what a wonderful thing. Nothing was hid. She got her prayer card, you know, and waited. So as it was, and she, <clears throat> as she came up in the line, finally, day after day she waited, she grew more interest all the time. As the revival went on, my her heart was hungry. After a while, she got before Solomon, and the Bible said there wasn't nothing but what Solomon revealed to her discernment. And here was Jesus standing, the God of Solomon. A greater than Solomon is here, seeing. And they said, show us a sign, Master. A greater than Solomon is here. And the Queen of the South come from the uttermost parts of the earth, to hear the wisdom of Solomon, and behold, a greater than Solomon is here. And we have had 2,000 years, 2,800 years since then of Bible history, and tonight, a greater than Solomon is here, with the promised word of this day. And we still we mope right along, no wonder she'll stand in the day of the judgment and condemn Birmingham, United States, all the rest with a testimony for her heart was hungering to see God, and she stayed till it was over. What did she say then, after she seen the real thing happen? You know what she said? She, after Solomon revealed to her what was in her heart, why she said all that I ever heard, and even more than that why it had been done on her then. She had seen what somebody else had said about it, but it was her turn then. Hers, her secret had been revealed to her, and she said, it's greater. And she said, even blessed are the man that's with you that sees this all the time. The man that stands here and sees these things all the time. Blessed are they. And she seen the way he went up to the house of the Lord. She became a believer and promised to rise in the last days and condemn the generations as it was in the days of Solomon and as the days of Jonas and so forth. She'll rise in this day and condemn in the resurrection the people that lived in this day for a greater than Solomon is here. The Holy Spirit himself is here. The creator of heavens and earth is here, identifying himself with his people with the same kind of a gift exactly like was in Christ, him doing it, like was in Solomon, him doing it, like was in the prophets and him doing it, like prophesied for the last days, we haven't had it for hundreds and hundreds of years. And as it was just before the first coming, they had no discernment for hundreds of years, and there it came on the scene, and somebody introduced the Messiah and promised the next thing coming right along in the last days, as it was then. Here we are in the last days. Signs that he promised would happen. The world situation just the way it's supposed to be. The immorality of the world and everything that we got just in position. And the Holy Spirit right in the position, doing exact. Oh, it's a wonderful thing to know that we serve a real God. I feel like telling something now. I've told it before, but I think I feel led to say it again. As everybody knows, I hunt, not so much for the game. I like to be in the woods. My mother was a half-breed, you know that? My mother was a half-Indian Cherokee, Indian. Her mother drawed the pension, see, in Tennessee. And so now we find out that in that, I love to hunt. And my conversion never taken it, because I, my first Bible was in the woods. I could see a flower, how it died. The little seed laid in the ground and rotted. Everything was gone, but the next year, there was nothing you could find. But you could take that handful of dirt to the laboratory. There is not a chemist in the world could find that germ of life in there. But it lived again when the sun came up. It lived again. And that let me know there was a life, death, burial, resurrection. I see the sunrise of a morning. 
it's a little baby born and at eight o'clock it starts to school and at around 10 o'clock out of college then at noon time it's in its strength two o'clock it's 55 old years old and then along about four o'clock it's getting eight eighty five it's gone it served god's purpose but what if it served god's purpose that the end of it no it rises up the next morning to testify there is a birth life death resurrection but the first thing a seed planted in the ground if it isn't dramatized it will not come up it's got to serve god's purpose in order to come up and so do we we are a dramatized seed in the ground and we must serve god's purpose or will never come up in the first resurrection come up for judgment in the last just like a hybrid corn it comes up long enough to take its judgment as of the sun and it dies and goes back and that's all of it exactly right but the real seed lives their lives again it lives again produces itself look at the sap in the tree just before any frost falls or anything else the tree the signature somewhere gets a hold of it says run down at the bottom of the tree right quick get down in the ground causes a frost coming and if it don't it'll kill the tree and hides down there until all the freeze is over then comes right back up again some intelligent does it you know what intelligent that is you explain that to me what intelligence makes that tree go down hide itself and come back up i'll tell you the intelligence that tells me who you are and where you come from and what you've done and where you're going and that's the same thing cause it's the same god sure exactly it's god that does those things now remember friends one day i was hunt hunting where i used to go hunting up in the north woods and i hunted with a friend and i love to hunt with him he was kind of a part of an indian too and he bert he's a fine man a man might be sitting right here now for all i know he comes down south here all the time and he was a great hunter you never have to worry about him he's not going to get lost we hunt together and we know each other but he was a more cruelest hearted man I ever met in my life he would shoot phones just to make me feel bad because i didn't like uh, to see you kill little fellows it's all right to kill a fawn now if the government says so i was a game warden for years and i'm still a conservationist i believe in animals and i believe in conservation and let them adjust if if you let them keep on going they'll put here to eat if you don't eat some of them out then they are take a disease and die out or starve to death but just what the law says they know how to handle that let them take care of it but bird would kill them just to be mean just to see me feel bad about it he used to say he said billy you're a good preacher or a good hunter but trouble of it is you are too much of a preacher you are too chicken-hearted and i said but you are just cruel that's all and we'd go on one day i went up it was at to work late and it was a uh, little getting late in the season and a wild tail deer i don't know whether you have them here or not oh my you talk about you didn't being an escape artist they are better than he it was uh, late in the season They had uh, been shot at a few times and we started one morning about six inches of snow started up across the presidential range and we taken some always take hot chocolate and a sandwich and about noon time if we didn't get a deer then we'd separate in the mountains and come back get in sometime nine or ten o'clock that night if we got a deer we hang him up we knowed where we were at and we'd come back and get him so that morning we went up and so before i left he said hey billy i got something for you this year and i said what is it he reached down in his pocket 
and pull out a little whistle, something about the size of this, and he blew it, and it sounded like a phone calling for its mommy. You know, the little baby deer calling for its mommy. I said, Bert, you wouldn't be that cruel, would you? He said, oh, you chicken-hearted creatures, you are all alike. So he started up the hill, and along about 11 o'clock, there was an opening about the size of this room, maybe a little larger, and we hadn't seen a truck. It was moonlight, and there was feeding at night, and they were just, and it's hard to find them. They just did hid, lay down, and so under the brush, and back in the deep timber, and they'd pour down and eat moss and forget it. So then we would, I come to this little opening there, and he sit down, I thought, he was bank of a snow there adrift, and I thought he was going in his pocket like this to get out a little thermos bottle and take a drink of this chocolate, and we'd eat our dinner, and then separate, and we'd go back across the ranges. He'd go one way and me the other, but when he did, I started to reach and get my sandwich, cause I was getting a little hungry. And I set my gun down against a tree and reached back in my sack and I looked at him. He looked up at me and he had eyes just like a lizard anyhow, you know, like women paint their eyes today, you know, that funny looking dog like on them. And then had all painted up like that. Well, and that's the way his eyes looked, kind of like a lizard, kind of a slanting like. He looked up at me and I thought, What's he got on his mind? He reached down and brought out this little whistle. And I thought, I said, Bert, aren't you ashamed of yourself? And he blew it. And when he did, just about 30 yards, or hardly so far, a big door stood up. Now the door is a mama dear. That was a baby calling. She, he blew the whistle. She jumped up. Now, she couldn't have done that by no means. She knew we were there. But a baby was in trouble, and he looked at me, the lizard eyes again. I see him move the safety down on that thirty o six rifle. He was a dead shot. Oh, he was a good one. And he blew the whistle again, and that old mother deer walked right out in that opening. Now, brother, that's unusual. They wouldn't do that. First thing, she wouldn't have got up. If she would, she'd have went the other way. And here she was, walked right out in the opening, and she knew we were there. And as soon as the safety clicked on that gun, she turned around and looked right at the hunter. Instead of running, she just stood there. Her big ears, her eyes wide open, her ears thickened up, and she was looking around. What was it? She was a mother. That was a baby. Her baby was in trouble. The little lamb, the little fellow was crying like a little fawn. She wasn't a hypocrite. She wasn't uh, putting on something. She was genuine. She was born a mother. That's what she was, a mother. And he leveled that guard down. I thought, how can you do it? But how can you? I couldn't look at it. I turned my back. I thought, Lord God, how can a man be that cruel-hearted to blow that faithful heart of that mother looking for her baby? and coax her out there, deceive her, and bring her out there, and then I know he was such a dead shot. He would blow that sacred heart of hers, plump through the other side of her. And her, a mother, she would actually come, cause that was a baby, and talk about a sign that was one of it, of loyalty, because something was on the inside. She was a mother, and I turned my back. I said, Lord God, how can a human being be that cruel to do a thing like that? And I waited, and I waited, and the gun never fired. I thought any minute I'd hear the gun go off, and it was. He'd a hundred and eighty green bullet mushroomed and blowed her heart plumb through her, and I thought, why didn't it go off? And I was standing this way, and my eyes closed, praying, and when I turned my head to look, the gun barrel was going like this. And I looked at it a few minutes. Him wiggling the gun barrel, he turned up and looked. And those lizard eyes had took another look.
The tears was rolling down his cheeks. He threw the crown on the ground. He said, Billy, I've had enough of it. Lead me to that Jesus that you talk about. What was it? Right there on that bank of snow, I led that cruel-hearted man. He's a deacon in the church now. What was it? He saw something real, something genuine, something that wasn't some theology or some historical something. He saw God in reality. That's what brought him. Oh, how many in here would be the kind of a much of a Christian as that dear was a mother, sure, with a real experience in the face of death. I mean, conscience is a man. Let us bow our heads, Heavenly Father. The hour is lit and the people are attentive. They're nice and they're listening. And this little story now, Lord of, I can remember that cold November day standing up there and the winds kind of blowing across a mountain and I can see them glistening tears running down them bearded cheeks when he held me by the leg and he cried and said, Billy, you have talked to me about someone that's love and I see some reality here. There is something in that deer that drove her out there, Lord, and it's a real motherhood in there. It was a real sign that there was a genuine love and motherhood. Oh God, let the word speak tonight, genuine Holy Spirit, not something emotional, enthusiastic, which it is also, but something that's real by the word made manifest, the word sharper than a two-edged sword, and designs the thoughts that's in the heart, which you identified with all your prophets when you were on earth, you called them gods, you said, you called those who the word of God came to gods. Then how can you condemn me when I say I'm the son of God? O oh Lord, the world knows its own, it's been blind all the ears, and I pray tonight, Father, that you'll open the eyes of the people and let us tonight become real Christians and real believers. For greater than Solomon is here, a greater than all the prophets is here, the Son of God himself is here, in the form of the Holy Ghost, promising a little yet, a little while, and the world won't see me no more, the world cosmos, the world order, won't see me no more, yet ye shall see me, for I will be in you even to the end of the world. And Father, you see the same message today and forever, and we know it's a truth. Oh, I pray God that you'll have mercy tonight, and while we have our heads bowed, I wonder tonight with our heads bowed, would anybody that be honest with God now in his presence, before you've seen anything happen, but yet you know in your heart that you're not as much a genuine Christian as that dear was a mother. And the reason she was a mother is because she was born a mother. She couldn't help being that. She was born a mother. And now, if you are not born, if you ain't got that same love for Christ, regardless of what anybody says, you believe him. He's a man, the same message to end forever. And you would like to have that kind of a Christian love in you as that mother's love produced for her. Would you, with your heads bowed, everybody now, and every eye closed, raise up your hand, say, pray for me, Brother Branham, and I'll certainly do it. God bless you, brother. God bless you. Oh, my look around on the floor, up in the balconies, all across. Don't be ashamed. If you're ashamed of him here, he said, I'll be ashamed of you before the Father and the Holy Angels, then you are in his presence now. He is here. He is absolutely here. The great Holy Spirit, that pillar of fire that was with Moses, is right here. Remember, when he was here on earth, he said, I come from God and I go to God. And they said that Moses forsook the treasures of Egypt, considering the treasure of Christ greater than all the reproach of Christ, greater than all the treasures of Egypt. He went into the wilderness with Christ, and any Bible reader knows that the pillar of fire was the angel of the covenant. And the logos that went out of God, which was Jesus, and then when he died, he ascended up into heaven. And when he met Saul on the road to Damascus, he then turned back to the pillar of fire again and even put Paul's eyes out with brightness. Now he's here tonight, the same yesterday, today, and forever. Would you like to identify yourself before him? Say, Lord God, I haven't got that kind of an experience. I want to have it. 
I'm not asking you to come up here. I'm just asking you to raise your hand to him if you feel like that. Was there some that hasn't raised your hands? Raise your hands now. God bless you. Now, Heavenly Father, there you are. Science says, according to science, we cannot raise our hands. Gravitation holds it down. But there's a spirit in men and in women, and they, another spirit, come to them, which was the Holy Spirit, and said, raise up your hand. And they defied the laws of gravitation and raised their hands towards God, who made them, I want to be a real Christian. Heavenly Father, I pray that you will make each one of them real Christians through Jesus Christ's name. They are yours, Lord. How little did I know that day that when that little deer walked out there on that field, it would be the cause, but it was a sign. But thou knowest all things. So I pray, Father, that you will receive them now. They are trophies of the gospel. They are yours. You said no man can pluck them from my hand, from my heart, and from my hand. And you said all that is mine belongs to the Father. No man can pluck them from his hand. Jesus said in St. John 5.24, He that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me has everlasting life and shall not come into the judgment, but is passed from death unto life. Lord, that's your word. Now, not them that makes believes, but them that really believe have eternal life. They are yours, Father. I give them to you now in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Now be real reverent. Just a moment. Now it's just exactly time to close. But just wait for a moment. Before we do that, how many believe that Jesus Christ promised to be with us? Wherever two or three were gathered in his name, Colossians says, Amen. How many believe that he is the same yesterday, today, and forever? Amen. He, is, he would be, if he was here tonight, he would be just as he was then. He would do the same thing. The Bible said that he is a high priest that can be touched by the feeling of infirmities. You, is that right? Amen. New Testament, Hebrews, the third chapter, a high priest that can be touched by the feeling of infirmities. Now have faith in God. Now just believe real with all of your heart. And you out there now that's out in this audience that doesn't, that's sick. How many of you is sick? Raise up your hand. Just say, I'm sick. Now just real low, real quiet. Now everybody, now you pray. Say, Lord Jesus, but Abraham doesn't know me. But what he said tonight, a greater than Solomon is here. And I know that's prophesied return. It hasn't been in the world for hundreds and hundreds of, and thousands of years, but you promise it would return again in the last days, according to Malachi 4, and promise in St. Luke 17, and all these other promises, you said it would be here when the Son of Man revealed himself, because it has to be the Word, because the, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and the Word designed the thoughts, it was the Word in the prophets, it was the Word in the Son, it was the Word in you today, see, the Word, it's prophesied, promised, although you find many impersonations, many kind of competition, that doesn't take away from it, from the real, there is a real Holy Ghost, a real God, now, you believe with all of your heart and look at this away to me and believe with all of your heart and say, Lord God, I'm going to pray and I pray that you will reveal to Brother Barnham and let me touch your garment and you turn through him because he don't know me and tell me what my trouble is and then I'll know that your presence is here. Friends, you know, what's the matter with Pentecostal people? They have seen too much. An old salt one day was coming from the sea and he found a writer going to the sea. And the old salt said to the writer, said, Where goest thou, my good man? Said, Down to the sea. Oh, I want to smell its salty brines. I want to see its blue skies, the white clouds, the seagulls. He said, I was born on it 50 years ago. I don't see nothing so attractive about it. That's it. You had seen so much of it till it become common. That's what's the matter with us people. We have seen so much of God. This church that's been called out of the dimensional groups in the last days has seen so much of it until it's become so common. You just overlook it. Don't never let Christ become common to you, friend. Don't never do that. 
you just believe with all of your heart and all that's in you now have faith in God now just pray and let the Lord Jesus grant it now you just touch his garment I don't know you you touch him he can be touched now just pray now I don't say that he will do it just a moment you settle it or just kind of have your hearts fixed on him now it's a light don't nobody take a picture or flash picture just be reverent now here it is it's over woman sitting here now looking at me right here at the end right there do you believe me to be a servant of Christ I'm a stranger to you you don't know me I don't know you but if God will describe to me just like you do to the woman just tell her her blood issue or the five the woman with had five husbands if the Lord just will provide that information to you through me would you believe it with all of your heart you'll know whether it's the truth or not all right it's a better trouble if that's right raise up your hand aha uh -huh, see now that's right here you sitting next to her you was going to help her you touched her with your hand now you are kind now you believe god can tell me what your trouble is you believe that he can do it high blood pressure if that's right raise up your hand the man sitting next to her do you believe sir believe god can tell me what your trouble is you'll know whether it's the truth or not a very close veins you believe the little lady sitting there kind of crying like your trouble is nervousness that's exactly right what kind of a shadowed you got a week in the daytime you think you're losing your mind the devil tries to tell you that but you're not it's all over from tonight now see you've got the victory it's left you the black shadow that was over you has left you you was weeping there sitting next to her lady it you it thrilled you now do you believe me to be his prophet or his servant that stumbles some people you see so you i don't know you we're strangers you believe god can tell me what's your trouble all right you have a heart trouble kidney trouble and you are anemia if that's right raise up your hand this little lady sitting here kind of a heavy set a red and dark stripes dress on she's praying she wants to be called in this line if that's right raise up your hand lady do you believe god can tell me what your trouble is your friend will be all right the spiritual problem will be all right and your female trouble will leave you if you believe god with all of your heart now if that's right raise up your hand if that's what you was praying about raise up your hand so that people can see what you're doing all right see all right now you just have faith in god somebody back you don't have to be sitting here on the front way back believe with all of your heart way back there there's a woman she has got a growth on her side she is praying she's going to miss it lord god help me i pray mrs goodman you believe with all of your heart and god will take that growth from your side all right step raise up your hand way up so that people can see you i'm a total stranger never seen her there she is is them things right raise up your hand all right a lady sitting over there out towards the end there she's suffering with the girl product trouble and she's also she's got a diabetes heart trouble mrs holderfield believe you love your heart lady and you can be healed there now please don't move around people i ask you in christ's name don't do that see diseases go from one to another see unbelief is the most horrible thing there is in the world just have faith here's a little lady sitting here praying about her husband he drinks that's right you're praying that he'll stop drinking is that right all right i don't know you got a prayer card you don't have you don't need one just faith that you've got you touched something you are 20 or 30 feet from me you touch a high priest the little lady behind her there is praying about her husband too sitting behind him that's right your husband is a nervous man kind of a mental nervousness he's missing right now if that's right raise up your hand and you've got something wrong with your hand 
you have allergy something or another and you touched stuff it makes your hands go bad is that right mrs paddy is your name you believe with all your heart now if that's right raise up your hand amen see i've asked you to believe me what about this lady sitting here you got a mark on your face like a little skin cancer do you believe me to be god's servant you do i don't know you you're a stranger to me and that's not exactly what you're praying about you're praying about a heart trouble that you got that's right is that right and this lady sitting here if you believe with all your heart you can have your healing your husband got his last night why not you excellent preacher now believe with all of your heart and you now you see just so you would know you was kind of questioning in your mind see now you're satisfied aren't you that's it does all right raise up your hands if that's right have faith in god what do you think of that diabetes sir sitting here with your hand up do you believe that god can heal diabetes and make you well you do all right sir god can heal you you are a stranger to me too if you'll believe with all of your heart there's a man sitting there that's got heart trouble something is wrong with his back mr easter he has hurt he was hurt in a train accident that caused that if that right raise up jesus christ will heal you and make you well how many of you believe conscience says amen are greater than solomon is here do you believe it amen jesus christ has same message done forever swept climbed across a building do you believe now that he's here amen he is right here now that's a reality that's exactly what he said would take place these things that i do shall you also more than this will you do for i go to my father one time a woman touched him he got so weak he said virtue went from me and he was a son of god i'm a sinner saved by his grace more than this shall you do i know the king james says greater but in the original it says more than this shall you do for i go to my father now, do you believe that Joshua says amen? Do you believe his presence is here? Amen. And why not lay your hands over one another, you believers, and pray for your fellow man sitting next to you? Each one of you lay your hands over on each other and believe with all of your heart now as you pray. Pray the way you do in church. Believe the way you are always believed. Now, let that spirit of God that made you a Christian be just as great and royal to you as you are praying for that person that as that mother dear had in her being a mother that royal spirit of christ that's here now that the world don't believe the world hates it the world doesn't understand it the bible said they wouldn't the world knows its own and god knows his own he promised it it's a truth so help me it's a truth jesus christ the same message to end forever pray now Lord Jesus, here lay some handkerchiefs laying here that's for the sick and afflicted, and I lay my hands upon them because you're taught in the Bible that they taken from the body of Paul's handkerchiefs and aprons and unclean spirits went out of the people and they were healed of diseases. Now we're not Saint Paul, but you're still Jesus, and I pray that you'll honor these for these people that couldn't be in the meeting. May when they are laid upon the people, may it come to pass. Like one of the writers said, when the Red Sea got in the way of the children of Israel, God looked down through that pillar of fire with angry eyes, and the sea got scared because it was standing in the way of the path of duty to believers, and the sea moved back, and the believers went over to the promised land. Lord God, look down through the blood of your son, Jesus Christ, tonight upon these handkerchiefs and upon this audience here with their hands laying on each other, praying for each other. You said, confess your faults one to the other pray one for the other that you may be healed for the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous availeth much i pray god as a confessed christian tonight is praying for the person he has his hands on may the power of the holy ghost come upon that person may the spirit quicken to them lord the reality may they not miss it lord let them not be like someone that's going to miss it father may birmingham catch its vision now of the presence of the resurrected jesus christ are greater than all the prophets are greater than all of the preachers greater than all the popes and the potentates whatever it might be it's jesus christ the same 
yesterday, today, and forever, uh, vindicating himself in the last days by his promised word. Granted, Lord, I pray this faith, the prayer of faith for them, as we pray for each other in Jesus Christ's name, we present it to you. Now, each one of you, as you got your hands on somebody, now just close your eyes and remember that Christ has promised this, has come here and vindicated himself. Yes, I see a man healed right there with a TB sitting right back here in front of me. Now, if you just, it's just going on everywhere, everywhere in the building. Surely, if God, a man can tell anything, they don't make it so. But when God comes down and tells it and vindicates it and proves it to be the truth, to disbelieve it is unpardonable sin. Jesus said, it will never be forgiven in this world or in the world to come. The scripture promises this, and here it is vindicated right before you people. In the name of Jesus Christ, receive him while he is here in the presence of us tonight. While we are with him, will you believe it? And all that truly does believe it and accept him as your savior or as your healer, Will you stand to your feet to give testimony? I stand as a testimony. I truly believe. And I now accept my healing, my salvation, and all my needs in the presence of Christ. I now accept it. In my <clears throat> look over the building, almost all the congregation standing. Wonderful. That's beautiful. Now it's all over. If you just believe it, if thou canst believe, now let us close our eyes and raise up our hands and sing, I love him, I love him, because he first loved me. Let's give him the praise as you're singing now. Sing to him these praises. I love him. I love him because he first loved me and per just my salvation on Calvary's tree. Let's raise up our hands and say, Praise the Lord. Conscience says, Praise the Lord. 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 I love him, everybody. I love him because. I think you are that you are to dismiss them, Brother Arshan. Somebody says, What about the ones that wanted to be saved? I'll ask them to come forward and burn just my salvation on Calvary's tree. Now, bow your head just a moment. The piano, the organist, the pianist, go right ahead. I wonder tonight, is your conviction still believing? I wonder if you believe that the God who can tell me the secret in the heart to prove that he don't have to do that now, but he said he would do it. When Jesus came the first time, he didn't have to heal, but he said he would do it. And he did it that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet, that he does it tonight because the prophet said he would, and Jesus said he would too. Now I wonder if you, who wants that love of God in your heart, like the mother dear had for her baby, you want that love in your heart for Christ, and you believe he'd hear our prayer, would you come stand here while we pray for you, while we sing that once more? Just come right up here. Just make a public confession then. Just walk right out and stand along here if you believe it. Prayer, my prayer will help you. You come right up here while we sing this again. I now prove that you love him by coming. I love him. God bless you because he first loved me. And come down out of the balcony. We'll wait for you. That's right. My if you're really sincere, come on our salvation on Calvary Street. The people leaving the balcony is coming down. Everybody sing now. I just uh, get the aisle, right in the aisles, wherever. Come right on. Because the first love me remember, the God that will meet you at the judgment has met you here in the church tonight. My salvation on Calvary Street. 
I wonder if all the ministers here that's interested in lost souls, that still has a vision for people in need, if you'll we'll walk up now among the people, all you ministers in here, every minister that believes that God will save a sinner, you might see one of the greatest things just happen just now. You have ever seen this is what the Holy Spirit likes. I love him. Now prove it. Prove that you're interested. You love him. If you love him, you love his children. Love him because weave yourself. Now weave yourself right in among these people here. Love. Just come right on up and get among the people right like this. And read yourself right in and lay your hands upon them. And come right up here now. And we're going to pray. I believe the Holy Spirit will be poured out upon the people tonight right here in the audience on Calvary Street. Oh, how I love Jesus. Get in love with him. You can read his word. How I love Jesus. Oh, how. Now close the world away from you now. Close all the world away from you. Sing. Because he first loved me. Oh, how I. He's wonderful. Oh, how. Now ministers, get someone in your Keep me now. Ministers, come right in. Move in. Right in um, around the people. Oh, how I love Jesus. Because he first loved me. Now he is standing here. He knows everything that's in your heart. Don't you think he knows that right here? Wasn't no secret. He knows just what you are. Talk. What you are meaning. Now let's bow our heads, each one. All over the audience, you that even couldn't get here. Now let's pray. Each one of you just confess all your wrong. Confess all your unbelief. Say, Lord Jesus, maybe I belong to church once. I went to church, but I never was satisfied. There was something another. Oh, I might have, I might have shouted. I might have spoke with tongues. I might have join church. All these things, they are fine. I have nothing against that, but that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about love of God that really down there, that the Holy Spirit, that's it. And you want that something that's real seasoned that will make the Word of God just live through you and act through you, see? No roots of bitterness in the channel. Holy Spirit just flows right through you. That's what you want. Now, just Bow your head and reverently pray, and your ministers lay your hands upon them now. Our Heavenly Father, we are bringing to you, you tonight, this audience of people that stands here making confession, knowing that they have been wrong. Their problem, motives and objectives too, has been wrong. But tonight they have come believing, believing that you will forgive every sin. Many of them has went to church for years. Many of them has done great charitable deeds, but Lord, tonight they are wanting the reality. They are wanting that sweetness, that something that they are lacking in their lives, that Holy Spirit of God that moves in there, the form of the word. And your servants, the ministers, your servants has their hands laid upon them and they are praying for them this prayer and asking Lord that this will be the time that no other way but right down in their heart. It will be one time forever in your presence. Be settled right now. May the Holy Ghost come into their lives just now and make them sweetened, Lord, with the great honey of heaven and give to them an experience that will be an everlasting experience and the great presence of the living God may come boldly into their lives and will give to them that what they have need just now. Grant you eternal God they are yours. I present them to you as love gifts, as the sacrifices, as they're making here. And may the Holy Ghost just make it real to them now. God grant it in just name. Your pastor is going to pray. The brother says, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord, grant it.